Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listeners. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Louisa, your host, International Passion Ambassador. And if you like this episode, please do subscribe. A very exciting guest today, Kelvin Chin. Kelvin Chin is a life after life expert. Kelvin is passionate about enabling others to understand death and dying and to overcome their fears. Kelvin is the author of the best-selling book, Overcoming the Fear of Death, through each of the four main belief systems, a non-religious approach to the four beliefs that underlie all religions and cultural beliefs. Kelvin Chin has studied meditation personally with Maharishi Maharesh Yogi and taught the first meditation courses at West Point and in the US Army in Korea. Kelvin has developed a teaching methodology he calls Turning Within. Kelvin has had many experiences piercing the veil over the past 35 years and his past life memories reach back 6,000 years. Kelvin is a graduate of Dartmouth, Yale and Boston College Law. He is a frequent speaker at conferences worldwide. This is his story and this is passion. Kelvin, welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much, Louisa. It's great to be here. I'm so happy to have you on the show. I always like to give it a bit of a little bit of a background to our audience about a little bit about yourself and some pivotal moments in your life that have got you to where you are today. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. How far back do we want to go? We'll talk about this. Just life. whatever comes to you. Yeah. I mean, um, it's interesting. I guess I started, I'd say I guess, because I was told this by my aunts, uh, who were obviously older than I was. Um, when I was two years old, I, I had communications with my, what they considered my visible friends, who I described to them in some detail when I was two years old, playing in my grandparents' living room when I would go visit them, because they were still living at home. My mom was the eldest in the family, got married first. And so um, I guess that's my first experience, according to these third-party witnesses, when I, who I described this to them, and uh, which I had forgotten until you know they told me when I was a teenager. I learned to meditate after that uh, when I was 19 years old. So that was a pivotal moment for me. As you said, I studied um, and learned Transcendental Meditation back then, 1970. And I studied personally with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, um, was an international leader in this, in this organization. So I was with the organization for about 10 years, and then I moved away from it when they went in a different direction. Um, but in the middle of the 70s, that's when I started having past life memories. It just kind of spontaneously popped up out of nowhere and um well out of somewhere <laughs> but <laughs> somewhere but not something i hadn't been studying it or reading it or anything and and just there it was uh, i started having memories from uh not this lifetime <clears throat> and then in the mid 1980s again spontaneously um i started getting communications from the other side so uh various beings uh, angels, archangels, dead people, people I didn't know, people I did know, et cetera. And all of that has continued, both the reincarnation memories and the communication with the other sides continue to present day. So that, that's kind of my, the, you know, the spiritual self-development side of me. And then I had a business career for decades, raised a couple of children and had a, you know, family of four of us and so forth. And a normal human, a normal human life that yeah, side, yeah, I had the other, the other part of me, whatever you call that, yeah, you know, and then the, uh, the public-facing side, although I was publicly teaching meditation and helping people with death and dying issues and grief and so forth for, for all those years on the side, and now I've been doing it, as you know, full-time through my nonprofits for the last six or eight years now. <clears throat> I've got so many questions to ask you after this. This is so exciting. I'll, I'll, I'll try and do it sequentially. So yeah. okay. <laughs> just That's so fine. I'm not all random talking. Meditation, yeah. I feel, I mean, for me, is such a powerful practice. If someone wants to get into med meditation or looking for meditation, what is your advice? Uh, my advice is to find a technique that's easy for two reasons. Number one, if it's easy, you'll do it. <laughs> if it's too <laughs> difficult, you won't. Uh, and uh, number one, easy. Number two, um, 
as effortless as possible in, in terms of the actual technique itself. Uh, why do I say that? Because really what meditation is essentially is opening ourselves to ourselves. And so to do that as automatically and effortlessly as possible without fighting the, the mind chatter that everybody has going on all the time is going to be the most effective way. Not to fight it, not to resist it. So as easy and effortless as possible without focus, without controlling the mind. Um, that's what I mean when I say easy and effortless. No directing the mind, not trying to clear your mind of thoughts. Because if anybody has ever tried to do that, you know from your own experience, if you've tried to do that, it doesn't work. Trying always creates more activity in the localized conscious area of the mind. That's a fundamental principle of every human mind. And so we need to find a technique, a meditation technique, that works the opposite of that. And so that's what I've been teaching for these 40, past 47 years. But, um, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Seek out that type of process that is as easy and as effortless as possible because that's what's going to turn on your parasympathetic nervous system the fastest, the opposite of the fight or flight, it's going to reduce your stress, and it's going to expand your mind out of that, what I call the eight-inch plastic bucket part of our mind, you know, the conscious uh, focusing part of our mind. It's going to expand our mind out of that as quickly as possible, expand our conscious capacity for experience. And I can only talk from personal experience. The more you practice like anything, whether it's exercise or any activity, I wouldn't say the better you get, but the more you're able to detach yourself from the ego or the mind. Yeah, I think it's the, it's the uh, familiarity with the process, and, and then that leads to familiarity with our own minds. And so to me, meditation distills down to allowing our mind to experience itself in this different way that we happen to be labeling and calling meditation. But essentially, any meditation technique is really, in its essence, our mind's experiencing itself. Now, people may say, well, my mind is like all over the place all the time. I'm not talking about that, only that part of our mind. I'm talking about that part of our mind and the expansiveness, the vastness of our mind. So that's really what meditation is all about, getting comfortable with that, familiar with that. And as we get more and more comfortable with that, that allows the conscious capacity of our mind to expand its capacity for experience. So that's, that's been my experience and that's the way I, you know, I teach the technique and that's what my students experience right in the first few, few days and weeks even. Very interesting. I, I mean, can I call you a meditation expert? <laughs> if, you, um, if you don't mind me asking yeah. your personal practice, how, how, what period of time do you meditate for a day? Does it change? Is it, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's not what most people think. Most people think, and I say this in my classes when I'm teaching my, my students, it's a four-day class I teach them. And uh, in fact, I just taught a new person today. I teach private classes, private classes and group classes. Um, I, I tell them this right up front that typically they'll th they're thinking that, oh, I've been meditating for 50 years now. It's, this is my 50th year of meditation, 5-0, which is like... It's amazing. Uh, I know. It's like crazy. I don't even feel that old. Anyway, so... <laughs> well, of, of course not. You're meditating all the time. I know. How did that happen? <laughs> but um, but they, they incorrectly think, oh, you've been meditating for five decades. You must be meditating two or three hours or four hours a day or whatever. No, it's actually the opposite. This, the, 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 the more years you meditate, the less time you have to spend in meditation because turning on this what I call the opposite of the fight or flight switch or the parasympathetic nervous mm -hmm. system, which expands our conscious capacity, that, 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 that becomes so familiar to you that you can turn it on just immediately. And so that's what my students experience just in a matter of months of learning. So it doesn't take years. And so as a result, the amount of time you need to spend in meditation is not that great. So I tell people 10 to 15 minutes uh, twice a day, is all they need to do. And then what, what I do to, ask, to specifically answer your yeah. question is I will sit, and if you were sitting here in the room with me, Louisa, and this is how you would know when I was done, because you'd see me get up and I always go and lie down. 
So I recommend that all meditation students should always have a resting period after the meditation. If their teacher has not told them the importance of taking a resting period after the meditation, that's a big red flag. That's a mistake. They need to rest afterwards. Otherwise, you can risk canceling out all the benefits of your meditation by coming out too quickly. So, so the, re, what you, the way you would tell is you would see me get up from the chair over there, and then I'd walk across the room, open my eyes up so I don't bump into my exercise bike and everything else here. And then I'd go lie down and close my eyes again and do a rest period. So you would see me get up anywhere from 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. It varies. But it's within that range that I get up. I don't time my meditations anymore. And I tell my students, you know, after a few weeks, you don't have to time yourself anymore. Unless you need to get someplace, of course. But then I go lie down. Here's the big difference. I will go lie down after the technique part, and then I'll lie down and rest for 10, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, sometimes an hour. Usually, usually 15, 20 minutes is I rest afterwards. So it's a longer rest period. The more years you, the more decades you meditate, the, the, it's not the longer the meditation, it's the longer the rest period afterwards because that becomes meditative, if that makes sense. Your mm -hmm. neurophysiology isn't even changing from that. It's still in the meditation physiology in your rest period. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It's very interesting. I haven't heard about the, the, how significant the rest period is. Huge, huge, yeah. Not many people teach that. It's, it's, a, it's a mistake. It's, it's, I mean, I'm just telling this to all of your viewers who do meditate. They don't have to do my meditation technique. They need to take a rest period afterwards. They'll find that the benefits they get from their meditation will skyrocket. It'll be exponential. They should rest at least, I tell my students, five to 10 minutes minimum. They can rest longer afterwards if they want to, if they want to just, you know, rest. And you can rest sitting or lying down. I, I prefer to lie down, but obviously, you see me back when we can travel again. You see me in an airport lounge. I'm not going to be lying on the floor. Why is that guy dial nine one one? Guy lying on the floor. No, I just sit there with my eyes closed. That's fine. But That's a fine. resting period, depending on the circumstances. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating, and I really want to talk about removing the fear of death. But I'd also like to talk about your past life memories that you've spoken about, and is um, <clears throat> were these during meditation that you? They were revealed to you. Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. But the very, very first one that I had, I didn't even know was a past life memory. So it came to me in 1977, around the beginning of God, you're good with dates. I couldn't do that. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I know. The reason I know it is because uh, later in 1977, I know that I was on a meditation course when something else happened that connected me to the dream that happened in the beginning of 1977-ish. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I know it was definitely 1977 because I know when I was on that meditation yeah. course. But, um, but I don't know, I was not keeping track of things. I didn't keep a journal or anything. I never thought I'd be talking about past lives and stuff. I talk about with a very close, small group of friends and we thought, nah, you know, big deal. You know, so what, you know, how does it help us today? You know, who cares who we remember, who we were, and so forth, and what we remember. But, but the dream that I had was a very emotional dream in the beginning, sometime uh, of uh, 1977. And I, it was so dramatic for me, emotional, like dramatic, I don't know if it's the right word, but it was so intense emotionally for me that I woke up and I felt like, you know, we've all had those kind of dreams. You just felt up like you you felt like you can't get out of the dream almost. It's yeah. like you're, you emotionally, you're just bathed in it emotionally, if that makes sense. All you know? consuming. Yeah. I mean, just, whoa. And, um, and it was not a lot of details in the dream other than that I was incredibly emotionally upset and crying and so forth in the dream, et cetera. And I, I don't know if I'd ever had a dream like that where I was that kind of emotional in a sad way, distraught um, and, uh, and so forth. And so, I just mentioned to it, uh, mentioned it to a friend, uh, I don't know, six or eight months later in, at that meditation course that I had mentioned. Um, and and um, so it was like November to December, we were on a two month long meditation, like every day meditating. We were in Switzerland with uh, Maharishi and a group of people and so forth. There were people in different hotels. And uh, in our hotel, there were about 80 of us or something like that. 
and um, we were just out for walking for a walk, going for a walk. And um, I told him, my friend, who were just after lunch, um, walking up through a meadow, cows on, it was just beautiful, cows on either side. And I told, started to tell him about the dream that I had had eight months earlier where I was, I just, I think I just told him like I was really upset. And then he told me the dream and he told me where I was in the dream. He told me what he described the whole thing to me, uh, what I was wearing and everything. And I said, wow. how did you know that? And he said, because I'm the one who found you. I found you then. See, I just thought it was a dream. I, I found know. you in that lifetime or on the yeah. astral? It, 2000 years ago, he found me in, in that ditch on the side of the road. He found me 2000 years ago. We were brothers. I didn't know this until, you know, when we, you know, more memories mm -hmm. came later. But I just thought it was a dream where I was upset. Okay. I didn't know it had anything to do with it, anything other than I was having a dream. I was upset. And he said, well, you know, you've been meditating in this hotel here. And for the last two weeks, you've been flipping over on your back and you've been crucified. You said you're being crucified. You feel like you're being crucified. And, uh, and I was upside down, being crucified upside down. Yeah. And he said, you know, who was crucified upside down? And I said, no. So, so uh, I grew up Protestant and, uh, and I went to Sunday school. Um, I think my parents literally just wanted time away from the kids. So they brought us and they parked us at school. They never went to church, right? You know, Christmas and Easter, they went to, that was it. And, and they, they just, my dad would drop us off and he'd go home and whatever. And, um, and I didn't pay much attention in Sunday school. But my friend who told me, he found me, he was an altar boy, Catholic, blah, 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 you know, the whole nine yeah. yards. And so he knew everything. And he said, um, you know, who was crucified upside down. And, and that's when he told me who, who, I, who I was. So, um, then I opened up and the floodgates opened up and I had all kinds of memories and um, being with Jesus and so forth and traveling and all his messages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that opened up in 1977. Um, interestingly, we can get to this later, uh, but uh, in 1970, I, in, in, in February 2020, yeah. somebody told me a story Another TM teacher from back then, who I just met recently, told me a story in, in, uh, about a, a TM teacher, his name's Charlie Lutz, uh, who was part of the spiritual side. I wasn't part of that side of the TM organization, he had a spiritual side, he had a more scientific side. I was teaching in the more scientific business-oriented or, side. He, this, this guy, uh, William Baldrich, told me a couple few months ago that he heard that Charlie Lutz in 1973 had talked about a TM teacher in the TM organization who was this person. Interesting. That so was four I, years before I had my memory. So people might say, well, you know, you, you have these memories of past lives. How does that help or transfer to this life? Exactly. What is the purpose? So what's the purpose? The purpose to me, well, I make it this purpose. I don't think there is a purpose mm -hmm. like cosmically, but I make it for me, the purpose of remembering stuff is to inform me more about who I am. My personality as Kelvin Chin today, because I'm fully immersed in being Kelvin Chin in the 20th and 21st centuries. And, and, and so how does it inform and help me live my life better as Kelvin Chin today? Better meaning more effectively, happier, more productively. So example, Another past life memory I had, and I talk about this in, 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 um, in my book. Here's oh, my yeah. Book. Do you want to hold it up? Yeah, here's my book. So there's my book. Uh, people can get it on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble online and so forth. And it's, it's available in Australia and India and all over the place, all over the world. Um, the one I talk about in there was when I was a slave. I was African. Very dark, black, blue, black. You know that phrase people say, blue, black, dark, that really dark, black skin. Yeah. Um, very, very dark brown, almost black skin. Um, around 2,300 years ago. And so I remember almost drowning on what I thought was the ocean. But it turned out to be the Mediterranean. I worked backwards. I, I, 
I teach people and tell people, follow the breadcrumb. So you get a little breadcrumb of information, follow it backwards and look at where, and so I, I, I had a, eventually had a picture of the boat where it was in that had gotten blown up and I realized, well, what kind of boat is that? I look it up and so forth and so on, find out that I was a Carthaginian slave. I was African, but I was enslaved by the Carthaginians fighting the Romans on what I thought originally was the ocean because I couldn't see land, but it was the Mediterranean, right? And so uh, 330 BC, I'm guessing I was probably in the Punic Wars. So close enough, 2,300 years ago. I have used that memory today to answer your question to fuel me because I willed myself, I remember the willpower. What I remember from that lifetime is willing myself to stay alive because I'd been floating on a piece of wreckage for days, I don't know how many days, but many days without food and water and I was literally roasting in the sun, literally, mm -hmm. you know, cooking in the sun, my body. But I willed myself mentally to stay alive. That has informed me today about the power of my mind through five layoffs since I was 50 years old. I've been laid off. Five, the company gets bought, and then they get rid of all the senior executives, and then another company gets bought. That's happened to me five times I since that. I was 50. And there's major age discrimination, regardless of what everybody, anybody says. doesn't matter what the laws are. You can't prove that they never look at your resume, right? Mm -hmm. And they'd see what my experience is. So that has pulled me through the will, my mental willpower, from that 2,300-year-old lifetime. Very interesting. That's one example. I mean, I love it. And I, My final question, and I don't want to talk about this the whole time, is... Are the lives, not past lives, but lives that are happening now, since everything is now? Yeah, my experience is that everything is in the, is in the continual present. So that not every, there's a difference between everything is ne happening now and everything is in the continual present. So everything is being experienced in the continual present, which is continually changing be the present, you know, every split second goes, that's yeah. the present, no, no, that's the present, that's the present. We're right. actually in the past now, by the way. Exactly, <laughs> right? So, 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 so as a result, I, my experience is not that, I mean, I have 20, 20, about 24, 25 uh, different lifetimes over the last 6,000 years that I remember. I've had more than that, I'm sure. Uh, but there's about memories from about 25 of them. Those are, they are sequential. They're not all happening now because they're, we are always in the continual present. I think that, 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 that confusion comes from when people go to the other side, their experience of time and space is very different. People will often come back and say that there's no time and space on the other side. I've had many experiences on the other side in this lifetime. I can go, go come, come and go. And so my experience is that time and space is extremely different on the other side. I use the, then, then here, um, I use the analogy of like, okay, what, what, we're energy. If we, when our physical, biological body dies, if we continue, then we're energy. So what, what is measurable as energy that we know on this side of the veil in planet Earth? Light, light the speed of light, we can measure. The speed of light is seven, is close enough, I'll round it up, it's like 692 million miles an hour. We'll round that up, 700 million miles per hour. That's eight times around the equator in one second. One eighth of a second to get around planet Earth. That's how fast the speed of light travels. Now, I don't know if we're, we're, we can travel as fast as the speed of light on the other side, but we can travel really fast. I know that from experience. Now, you can see where people would say, well, I was on the other side, and I was on this planet, and then I was on this planet, you know, in a, you know, a split second, you know, whatever. In a thought, a moment. Or... In a thought, yeah. If I can be, it's, it's, it's it. You can be in the same place at the same time. Not actually, but because time and space are so different. Because, and the other thing is, what's time? Time is a measurement of change. So if we experience, can experience the other side, it has to be in the field of change. It's not outside the field of change. It's within the field of change. And, the, and, and if we can ex have experience, and we experience individuality, we can have communication with beings on the other side and so forth, people can have that experience. There is change there. 
It's just the change is very different from here. So the subjective experience of time is different. That does not mean that time doesn't exist. So I think that may be where this notion of all our lives are happening at the same time comes from because, they, because there's a conflation, a confusion of this very distorted, different experience of time and space that people can have, not just on the other side, but just within meditation. Just talk about meditation. Those, those are your, in your audience who meditate very often have distorted experience of time space within a meditation. It feels like uh, two seconds went by and you may have had your eyes closed for half an hour, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same half an hour. It's not that time didn't exist. So people will figuratively use that expression. Time didn't exist in my meditation. Well, no, no. You're still within the field of change. Time did exist. Your watch didn't break. But your subjective experience, yes, was really distorted and different. That was great. Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> Really good explanation. So I just want to ask you about your experiences on the other side. You were talking about yeah. the other side. What is the other side and what are some of your experiences? I tell people right up front, I said, there's more, there's more, there's, there's less difference between the other side and this side than people realize. Now, of course, there's lots of difference. <laughs> we don't have biological bodies and blah, 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 you know, and physical hard objects and dense, you know, vibratory field and all of that. But I think it's instructive for people to understand that the other side is not as different as this side in terms of things like what we've already talked about, but also especially this, our mind, our consciousness, our soul, our spirit. I use the word mind, by the way. You'll hear me use the word mind. Soul, spirit, consciousness, awareness, same thing. Okay, sense. so you're referring to mind as the yeah, soul. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I use mind because I, you know, I work across now 42 different countries now. So I work across cultures and religions, doesn't matter. People come to me and I help them deal with all of these issues. And I want to use language that they can understand easily. But, you know, I'm not talking about the eight inch plastic bucket, yeah. just conscious. Mind. I'm talking about mind. Okay? You're not talking about the brain. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not talking about the brain. Exactly. So, so, uh, exactly. So, so, but, so there's less difference. What does that mean? That means that when we physically, biologically die, and notice that I'm, I've inserted just recently, within the last several months, the word biologically, because instead of just say physically die, because if, if you get a physicist who's very, <laughs> very nitpicky with you about physics, he could say, he or she could say correctly, and I would agree with them, that when you die, if your energy is continuing, and it's an identifiable, what I, I came up with this phrase, identifiable energy form, your individuality is continuous, identifiable, it's, it, it's it, 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 energetically identifiable, then there's still a physical something there. Okay, energy. All a right. residue. Uh, yeah, something. But, but not biological. So I say, but w when we go to the other side, our mind, our soul, our spirit, our consciousness continues, it's identifiable, and we take it with us. So that means we can take our fears with us too. That's why I do what I do, as you know, in my work. What am I doing? Helping reduce people's fears, not just about death and dying, but about anything. Anxieties, fears, and so forth, which are mentally created. And they, it's influenced by our body for sure. And they can deposit stuff in our body. We know cortisol, lactic acid, chemicals, so forth, imbalances. But mentally created. Because fear is caused by the anticipation of unhappiness. So my whole thing is to try to reduce fear. Because my experience is, we take our minds with us. Well, I'm preparing, I don't always say this, but to your audience, they would understand this. I am preparing people not just to live now in the present, in the continual present now, but also in that continual present, which will be, my experience, after they physically, biologically die on the other side. So I want them to be as fear-free then so that they can enjoy the other side maximally as much as possible. Now, when we physically, biologically die, do many of our fears drop away? Yes, because our fears that are associated with our biological body aren't there anymore. We don't have a biological body, right? But could we take other fears with us? Yes. And so I do whatever I can in my work to try to reduce that. That's what Jesus was intending to do 2,000 years ago. 
overcome, helping people overcome the fear of death. That's what he saw his resurrection as a tool to be used to demonstrate that when he saw that the religious and political forces at play at the time in Jerusalem were leading to his crucifixion. So he knew he was going to get murdered, but he used that, he intentionally used that to demonstrate, and he came back and showed himself to us 10 or 12 times afterwards. He used that to demonstrate the, the, the continuing life of us as a consciousness, soul, spirit, mind. Fear is such a big thing. I mean, for well, obviously, maybe I still have fears, but for many years I lived in fear. I don't anymore, will I say that. They probably all come up from time to time, but I call fear the destroyer of dreams. Yeah. And yeah, my baby. question to you is, and you did mention that most of our fears are dissolved when we die. If we are reincarnated, do some of those fears are in our energetic residue or in our mind residue, our soul residue? Yes, absolutely. So I, I wouldn't say most of them are just dissolved whether, when we die. I would say the ones that are oriented to our physical biological body, right? Because we don't have a physical biological body. So if we have a fear about cancer or whatever, you know, and then we die, we're not going to have the fear about cancer because we don't have a biological body to worry about getting cancer, for example. But we may have other fears uh, that still continue. And to answer your question, yeah. They continue throughout the other side. And if we want to come back, by the way, to answer a question that some people probably have, do you have to come back? No, you can hang out. I've hung out on the other side for 200 years, 500 Earth years, you know, at different times and so forth, and then come back. My most recent one, I was in World War II, it was like eight years on the other side, Earth years. But you can, you can come back if you want to. Nobody says you have to. There's nobody pushing you down, like, get out of here. You got to go back. No. It's just, it's a choice that people make. But yes, we take our fears with us because we, it's not just our fears we take with us. We take our strengths with us. We don't just take our weaknesses with us. We take our strengths because my experience uh, over the last 6,000 years of the memories that I have is that my personality continues and my personality has some weaknesses and strengths, we'll just call them, right? And so everybody's does. And so that my personality is what I take with me from lifetime to lifetime. And can the personality change over time? Yes. But my experience is that very slowly. So people who are narcissistic, don't hold your breath. You know, they ain't going to be changing out from not being narcissistic in one in lifetime or life. two lifetimes. They're, yeah, it's going to take them a while. But they have to want to, you know. They have mm -hmm. to see their... They have to see their own folly. Who am I? Yeah, they have to see the folly in being a narcissist. That, 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 that in fact, that cruelty of being narcissistic all the time creates, it, 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 you, have to, you have to make more people around you feel worse in order to make yourself feel better. You know, that's essentially the nature of narcissism and cruelty is to make, other, make yourself more important than the other people. That way you feel better because your self-esteem is so low. Your level of self-confidence is so weak. That's what narcissists do. They, 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 they puff themselves up by pushing other people down around them. So, so as, when they see that folly in that, then they will start to change. So my role is not to try to push narcissists or cruel people into changing, but to educate people. And maybe some of them may hear that, that educational point that I just made right there, that nutshell version. You know, it's a two-hour lecture. But, you know, then they, they, might, they might plant a seed and might cause them some doubt and start looking into why they might feel they want to change. I wanted to dis discuss a little bit more about, about fear, but my understanding is that we come back to this earth, to this physical plane in our human body to for the expansion of our soul's growth. If we're staying on the other side, how are we going to expand and learn? Well, I think we can expand and learn on the other side as well. Um, and quite frankly, in my classes, whether it's my, I teach an after, a six part afterlife and reincarnation series of classes and I teach meditation classes as you know, you've already referenced, 
I sometimes get a, a, a peek. I don't say this to my classes all the time, but sometimes I get a peek into the other side and I can see 50, 100 people in my class, in the classes, sitting in my classes on the other side. So there's still an opportunity to learn, is my point, on the other side. Oh, okay. And so we have an opportunity to learn whether we're on the other side or this side. That's a choice people make. We're not, the whole notion that Earth is a schoolhouse and so forth, that's an angelic thing. So that's an angelic notion that's been pr pr promoted via psychics and channels and so forth to people on Earth. It's a very popular theory. It's a very popular one, and the angels love it because they get more recruits when humans die and they go to the other side they get more recruits to the angelic there's not just one angelic religion there are many angelic religions on the other side but there's a bunch of them and so they get they, they've already kind of seeded sees -E, planted seeds mm -hmm. seeded the humans through psychics and channels and so forth that this is all about learning and da, 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 da. now the more self-aware people on on planet earth are more inclined to that because they do want to learn more about who they are and grow spiritually and so forth. But you look around, 7.6 billion people aren't here to learn. So some of them are here just for the soft serve ice cream. And I mean that seriously. I mean, they came back because they were maybe bored or whatever, or they wanted to procreate or who knows what, and they came back to planet Earth, seriously. Mm -hmm. And so there's a small percentage of the population that you're describing who acts absolutely are here to learn. And I'm here to learn, but not everybody else is, you know? And so people have choice, human minds have choices. And so some have chosen absolutely to come back and learn and to work out relationships or, you know, have certain soul contracts with other, other, other people and so forth and so on, whether it's family or friends or who knows what, or business, whatever. But not everybody has been that strategic. Because if you think about it, not all minds are strategic. How many of the minds that you know, that you just bump into in the supermarket, are strategic about how they're living their lives? Yeah. Most people are just opportunistic. Very interesting. I get this question all the time. Why would we come to this earth if there's so much suffering? Yeah, it's, so, so the reality is that first of all, you don't have to come to this planet Earth. You can go to other planets. I have memories living on other planets as well. So there's nothing that forces you to come back here. This is a choice that people make. And I think that one of the reasons people choose to come back here, it's not that they're looking for suffering. So, it's, so, so I think they gotta flip it around. It's like, why would people choose to come here even though there is suffering? In other words, they're not coming here because there is suffering, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so they would come here, I think primarily, again, we'll just, for ease of discussion, we'll just bifurcate and it is just oversimplify things and say the people who are strategic and the ones who are not strategic, the, the ones who are, who, who either group is coming back here, I think, for, for, for familiar reasons. It's very familiar. It's familiar. People tend to gravitate you think about, that's why I mean when I say there's less difference between this side and the other side, think about how a mind operates. A mind operates no differently on the other side than it does here. It just doesn't have a physical biological body. So do we gravitate towards things that are familiar? Yeah, people get into patterns of behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's logical, it makes perfect personality mind sense that a person would choose to come back to Earth as opposed to go to a different planet where they don't, you know, the gravity's different, the value systems are different, blah, 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 blah. You gotta get used to a different body. Oh, you can fly there. Oh, you can, know, you know, you can't fly here. You gotta walk here, that kind of stuff, you know? So, um, so I think it's in spite of the suffering, not because of the suffering. I don't think people, you know, they don't, they don't formulate and, and can take that factor into consideration when they decide to come to Earth, back to Earth, okay? Mm. I just don't think it's part of the equation. It's, it's superseded by other things. That's where my family is going. Ah, I gotta deal with the suffering thing. Okay, I gotta get a job. I gotta deal with jobs. I, there's this other planet. You don't have to have jobs. You know, people are taken care of and blah, 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 blah. You don't have to worry about food. I know I gotta deal with that, but that's who I wanna be with. Ah, they went down already, you know? I think those, those factors supersede the decision-making process. And you can just think of any number of other reasons, right? 
you like the taste of certain things. You cannot taste the, the ice cream on the other side. You can get it, but you don't have a biological body. I want the biological body for various reasons. Earth, I get the gravity, it's familiar. I want to, put, I want to go down there. Me personally, I think I come back here actually to help with decrease the suffering. So I go here because of the suffering. Like, I don't think that's why most people come. I do. I think I do. That's one of the reasons I come back. What a wonderfully interesting perspective you have on, on coming back to life. And of course you do. You're removing the stigma of fear from so many, of, so many people and so many of your clients. Right. It, it is funny fear. It's, someone said to me once, I'm not fearful anymore. I'll just repeat that. Um, <laughs> but it's almost, she said to me, why do you almost imagine that your future is going to be worse than your present? Why? Yeah. Which is it's interesting true. what you said. Yeah, I think that, I think to answer her question, I think for most people, they live beyond the imagination horizon emotionally. They're living always in the continual present because that's reality. You know, we're in the continual present. The continual present I, continue, I consider from here all the way to what our, our hor imagination horizon is. It's as if you can't see beyond the horizon physically. So it's the, they call it the imagination horizon. So people from here to there, that's their present. But people emotionally very often live on the other side of that. And that leads to suffering, unhappiness. Interesting. That would probably take me into the, I think, the four main belief systems that you talk about. Yeah. What are they? So, so I came up with these four main belief systems, talking to my buddy George, and we were like brainstorming this. It's like, why don't we talk about this so we can talk about death and dying more without stepping on people's cultural or religious toes? So these four beliefs are not religious or cultural, but they underlie all the religious and cultural beliefs. So the first one is the science belief about death, which is my, was my father's belief before he died. <laughs> and after he died, he went, oh, I was wrong about that. But uh, <laughs> he believed the science belief. You know, one life, that's it. The brain, like you said, you know, yeah. the brain and the mind, they are when the same. When you die, you die. You die, you die. My he father said, has the same belief. Yeah, my dad used to say, stick, cigar hanging out of his mouth. Cigar <laughs> hanging out of his mouth. Stick, stick me in a box, throw the dirt at me, I'm done. That was my dad. Oh my you know? God, mine says the same. <laughs> yeah, right? It's just like, yeah. It's like, you know, that a lot of people. So anyway, that's the number one. Second belief system that exists in the world, fear of continued existence. So they believe in an afterlife. I just call it afterlife. Some mm -hmm. Christians would call it heaven. People call it Valhalla, whatever, you know, Nirvana, whatever. But the continuation, but some fear, okay? For various reasons. Third belief system, belief in an afterlife no fear, maybe even looking forward to it. Fourth belief system, reincarnation, past lives can come back in another lifetime. And so people are everywhere and some, somewhere there with those four, the spectrum of those four belief systems. They fall somewhere there. Sometimes people are hybrids. They're like a one-two. I get a lot of one-twos. You know, I think that this is it, blah, 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 but I'm not sure. Or I'm afraid of oblivion. I'm afraid of after I die, I'm just going to be in this black void or something, which not happening. Don't worry about it. It doesn't happen. But, you know, but people have the fear. And they can create, they can concoct an experience that's very much like that just based on their fear, right? Mm. People do that on this side all the time. Exactly. I was just about to say, we, I, for the premise, we create our reality. So we certainly yeah. can create. They do it on this side. Is, is Earth a place of punishment? No. Do people get punished on Earth sometimes? Yes. Is it a place of punishment like hell? No, like a structural place. No, do people, do, do people, uh, is, is earth a place of fear, you know, fear? You know, everybody's fearful. No, can people create fear in their minds here on planet earth? Yes. It's how so, you perceive it. It's absolutely it's perception. Fear. Yeah, but it's not a structural place, just like it's not a structural place of fear and there's no structural place of hell and punishment on the other side either. Very interesting. I also know you do some grief recovery work. So how, yeah. how do you help loved so ones? The, the first thing about grief is to understand what grief is. And there's, a, there's huge misunderstandings about grief. So I just, you know, people equate very often uh, equate grief or grieving and sadness. They are not the same. So 
uh, where, first of all, where does grief and grieving come from? Mm. It comes from a loss. So a loss of some familiar pattern of behavior or some, or, or being a person, mm. a loved one, a dog or a cat or whatever. Um, um, so, so it comes from a loss, but it could from any, it come from any number of losses. It doesn't have to be a loss of a loved one. It could be loss of a job or divorce, et cetera. It says many kinds of losses, but grief falls into two, uh, two, 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 parts in, in, in the way I define grief. One is the overwhelming sadness. So yes, it's related to sadness, but it's not the same as sadness. It's the overwhelming paralytic part. That's grieving, okay? Part of grieving. The other is the conflicting feelings that can come along with that loss of that familiar pattern of behavior, whatever, or loss of person, familiar pattern of the person. So um, that conflicting feelings so with my mom who died in 1982, which what kind of what kickstarted this whole thing of me thinking about this stuff, about death and dying and grieving, because I was a mess. I was grieving her loss when she died very young. She was in her 50s. And um, I am no longer overwhelmed by the sadness, although I still experience sadness, right? About my, and and, I, and I, I, I've written about this and I tell people, that you don't lose the sadness. The sadness is directly proportional to the, 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 the depth of love you have for the loved one. So, so it's incorrect to, for people to say, oh, you'll get over the sadness, don't worry about it, you know, just give it time. Absolutely wrong. Absolutely disrespectful, I would argue, to that person you're trying to comfort. No, it's, it's the overwhelming part we can help them get rid of. And then the conflicting feelings, like my mom would say, don't, come visit me in the hospital. You need to be studying and so forth. And, you know, don't, you know, and I would take my books there, sit next to her. She'd go down to the chapel. You're wasting your time here. I'm dying. I know no, you're dying. And I go down the chapel and I cry and, I, you know, I couldn't oh. study. Right. So she dies. I have all these conflicting feelings. Should I listen to her? Should I not listen to her? I was only Almost five. like regrets in a way. Yes. Regrets. Yes. And like all and, uh, you know, all missed expectations of what I should have said to her, what I didn't say to her, I, you know, all this stuff. You know, uh, all of that is, is, is all part of this big um, burden that we carry, we call grief, you know? And so I help people relieve themselves of that, recover from, the, from that so they can move forward with their lives. I speak with a lot of people that are grieving. There's no time frame on grief, is there? So No, absolutely no. There's no time. You can grieve, you can, you can carry the grief, forever and from lifetime to lifetime we can talk about that we can carry that with us and so why not get you know recover from it we never i don't like the phrase getting past it because it's almost like it implies you're going to forget about the loved one who you lost or whatever it is you know no you don't forget but you can be un unencumbered by it that's what we can get a place to. So that unencumbered place where we can then begin living our lives free from the binding influence of the grief. That's the distinction. Almost like, because it can be, and it is very often all consuming, you can't do anything else when grief comes to you. Can be. And I experienced it. It was all consuming for me back then. Yeah. And, and so I know what that feeling feels like. And it, for every person, it's unique. It's individual. Everybody's unique experiences it differently, but it's debilitating is the bottom line. And so how can we help people get past the debilitation of this? That's the issue. We still experience the sadness, but then it's no longer debilitating. We don't have the conflicting feelings anymore, although we still have the feelings without the conflict. That's the issue. That's where we want to get to, right? And so that can be done. I know you talk a lot about happiness as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We, we don't have four hours to chat, but yeah. how, how do you find happiness? Well, well, first of all, so it's, it's like, what's happiness? And what, what is, uh, you asked me earlier, like before we went on, on uh, recording about passion. You know, how, how mm -hmm. do we, how, how, how do people follow their passions? And this flows into this happiness idea. So what passion is caused by, the anticipation of happiness. So passion is the emotion caused by the anticipation of, of happiness. I love that. Yeah. 
And it, 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 just like fear is the opposite. Fear is the emotion caused by the anticipation of unhappiness. Yeah. Right? So passion, talk about happiness, is the, is the emotion caused by the anticipation of happiness. So what can we do? We, we need to look for things that make us happy. Find stuff that causes that. But here's, the, here's where the rubber meets the road is that, you know, that's easy to say. But then you, st you st start going down that road and you find uh, things or relationships or people or friends and so forth that start to not <laughs> meet that end, right? It, it, and, that expectation and, is. Yeah. And so then what do you, because it's not meeting your anticipation of happiness. Now it's kind of cause you unhappiness. Uh, so, so we need to ask ourselves, I think, regularly, is it in our interest to continue to pursue whatever that is, the, the X, the Y, the Z, fill in the blank, right? And, and then the other thing that I think is useful is to find someone or someone's group of people, whatever, who, who have a similar passion. Because if they have a similar passion, then you kind of ask them and say, hey, what's it like, da, da, da. You kind of get their advice, right? Their input, um, rather than going to somebody, you know, who, who, doesn't, who, who doesn't care about flying airplanes. Uh, you don't want to talk to them about what, mm -hmm. you know, your passion about becoming a pilot, right? You want to talk to pilots, you know, because they obviously have a passion about it. So find somebody who has similar passion, and, you know, pick their brain, you know, that kind of thing. But, the, but I think a fundamental piece of that, I mean, that, there's been many books written on that stuff, but, but I think a fundamental piece that's missing is the turning within part, right? I was just method, about to say that. Right, is the turning within. Because what does that do? That you, we talked about expanding our conscious capacity for experience. What does that mean? That's expanding your mind. That's making your mind more powerful. That means getting more, having a more powerful mind that can do all those other things that we talked about, but in a more clear, powerful, productive way, effective way, right? And they also by turning within, what does that also do? The second thing that does is it aligns us more with what our desires and our needs are, as opposed to, you know, the needs, wants, people have heard that distinction, right? You know, your, mm -hmm. is your want really a need? You know, we really need to align with what our needs are more. Right, and so what? 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 What emotionally drives us, and is that a need? That by turning within, we get more in touch with our emotional patterns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who we are, what drives us? That that makes us more effective in terms of our seeking of happiness. Right? I love I love the turning within, but I'd also have to say that turning within all those ac wonderful actionable steps that you mentioned, turning within isn't relying on the external for happiness. It's only relying on the internal. So I often say to people, if you're relying on a, a lover or a person or yeah. something to occur, you're really giving away your power, your happiness to the highest yeah. bidder. Right. Yeah. In, in my book, I talk about this, this phrase uh, and it's probably six pages. So just to simplify it very quickly, it's borrowed from my friend, Charlie Donahue, who is a, we taught meditation together in 1970s and, um, he's a philosophy professor now, no, uh, no surprise. He came up with this model and he said, all experience can fall into this model, conscious of X, Y, Z. Most people identify, like you said, they identify with the X, Y, Z's of life, who they're married to, um, uh, how beautiful is she or how handsome is he? What kind of job does he have? How much money do we have? What car to car do we drive? Where do we, neighborhood, where our kids go to school? All of that, that's X, Y, Z stuff. Charlie would say, you forgot about the, the left side of the equation, the consciousness side, the who you are side, the mind. You are the experiencer. Those are all experiences, objects yeah. of experience. We are the experiencer. So like you said, we need to connect with ourselves, turn within, connect with the experiencer, which is us, strengthen that bond with ourselves, expand our capacity of experience in our self-knowing. That's what self-realization is. And that's where our happiness really comes from. Our happiness comes from inside. It's the inside out approach, I call that. It's an inside job. And right. always, <laughs> when we're right. happy within ourselves, our experiences are happier as well. Happier. Even, I tell people, even the experience of getting a flat tire 
is less stressful if you're happier with it. Yes. It's not that you like getting the flat tire. <laughs> it's that you can handle it. You could even chuckle about it and shake your head, even if you don't like it. You I don't agree. get overwhelmed and stressed by it because the object of experience is not who you are. It's just an experience. It's just an experience. All right. Kelvin, I've loved having you on the show. Is there something, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Is there something you'd like to talk to the Passion Harvest audience about? Oh, I think we've covered pretty much everything. I mean, just how to get in touch with me. They can Google my name, of course, mm -hmm. Kelvin Chin, um, and all my websites will come. I have four different websites. Here's a quick tip. I'll, I'll put them all in the show notes, but please continue. Okay, here's a quick tip for everybody. So you don't have to remember all of them. You can just go to kelvinchin.org, .org, nonprofit. And you can go to the bottom of any page on any of my websites. If you find one of them, you can find all of them because on the, in the footer is a hot link to other, the other three websites. I guess I have four of them. So one of them is my books. One of them is Overcoming the Fear of Death. One of them is Turning Within, the meditation. And the other is my more spiritual website, Kelvin Chin. And they should also subscribe to my YouTube channel. So my YouTube channel is just Kelvin Chin, Turning Within. Or you just Google my name and you'd find it also. Yeah, or look at the bottom of the show notes. They'll, they'll be there. Kelvin yeah. Chin, it's been a passionate delight to have you on Passion Harvest. Thank you so much for your different perspective than what I've heard for a while. So thank you for sharing that with our audience and speaking so openly and honestly about your life journey. You're very welcome. Great to have Great. Uh, you with you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interview.